stage. Okay. So, um, yeah, I'm a specialist dermatologist who has a practice in Macquarie Street. Um, I do both general dermatology, skin cancer, surgical dermatology, all forms of skin cancer treatment, plus most 50% of my practice is also cosmetic, both from um, topical skin preparations, prescriptions to laser therapies, Botox fillers, and all low-invasive procedures. So this is kind of a super summary, and there's a lot of science here, so I do apologise if there's too much science, but from my training and background, I kind of like to know things from first base principles and therefore all, all the clinical stuff makes sense. So I'm going to try and impart that to you today on a very broad um, topic. So this is just basically to get an idea. There's a lot of fluff and garbage out there in the cosmetic industry, particularly in topical agents, which probably a large number of them don't do more than what a basic good moisturiser could do. So we're going to talk about some actives that have got a lot of substantiated scientific proof and evidence that actually do do good things for the skin, whether it's from a rejuvenating point of view or treating specific common skin problems. Pretty much going to break that down into three main areas, which are your alpha hydroxy acids, your topical retinoids and all the different subtypes of those and those that actually work and those that may or may not, and then looking at different topical lightening agents and which ones really have the substantiated evidence to work to treat things like melasma and um, photo damage pigmentation as well. Now, there's a lot of slides, so I'm going to kind of buzz through them, okay? And if there's any questions, please feel free to ask. So I think it's really important to understand the general anatomy of the skin. This is the, skin, the body's defense system. It's basically divided up into three main components, being the epidermis, dermis, and the subcutaneous layer. The epidermis's main role is as a protective agent to keep things out. So this is really important to think about when, you, when you're designing topical agents to put on the skin to realise that most of them won't even get through the stratum corneum because it's a defence layer. The dermis is filled with the collagen and the elastin fibres, which we know is the support scaffolding of the skin, which volumizes the skin. And then it also contains what we call appendageal structures, which are basically your blood vessels and your sweat glands and your sebaceous glands. And then you have the subcutaneous fat layer, which is the, which is the supportive layer. The epidermis itself can be divided into basically the stratum basalum, spinosum, granulosum, and the stratum corneum. The important things here is the basal layer is your regenerative layer. It's the only repopulating layer of the epidermis. This is also where your melanocytes are contained. There's about one melanocyte for every eight to ten keratinite cells. What happens with the epidermal skin is that these skin cells are then produced at that basal layer and they undergo a process known as differentiation to end up being a non-nucleus containing cell, which is mainly just protein with lipid in between it, which is then your stratum corneum. A lot of people consider this the dead skin cell layer, but it's actually got a highly functional role with keeping the skin hydrated and keeping environmental elements out from, and causing irritation. If you don't have a good compact formed stratum corneum, you have a dull, aged, wrinkly looking skin and you also end up with problems like eczema. Okay, so the stratum corneum is quite fine, less than a, a piece of paper thick, and it's considered the bricks and mortar layer of the skin. Between these cells are desmosomes, which are little proteinaceous substances that holds them together. The skin, the turnover system for a skin to go from the basal layer and end up into a cell in the stratum corneum is about 30 days. This actually naturally slows down with the ageing process. When that slows down, the skin becomes clumpy, dry, lacklustre, and you end up with an irregular stratum corneum, which gives you an aged um, appearance. Hence, trying to maintain a cell turnover rate of roughly 30 days is important in maintaining a youthful appearing skin, and there are certain ingredients that can be really helpful in maintaining that natural metabolic rate of turnover. Okay, we just talked about all of that, we talked about that. So let's get down to the ingredients and what things do what. So the alpha hydroxy acids have been around for over 20 years, in fact, even prior to that. We all know the story of Cleopatra sitting in a milk bath in order to improve the quality of her skin. This is all because the milk was sour and therefore producing lactic acid, which of course is an alpha hydroxy acid and would act as humectant to moisturize the skin, but as well as to cell exfoliate and therefore make the skin a lot smoother. So they've been around for a very, very long time. In mainstream cosmetic chemistry, they've been used for well over 20 years. These are carboxylic acids that are hydrophilic, meaning they readily dissolve in both water and alcohol. So there are naturally occurring elements from both um, from food sources, such as your fruit, sugar cane, and milk. And they also can be chemically synthesized, which are the formats that we use nowadays in topical preparations. 
The two main AHAs that you'll see in cosmetic preparations is basically glycolic acid. This was the one that got the most press and use early on. It's the smallest of the AHA molecules and therefore has a very low molecular weight. And as a result of being tiny, it penetrates extremely effectively into that um, stratum corneum layer and, and completely through the epidermis. The lactic acid is slightly larger and therefore it has a slower penetration rate through the skin, but this can often be as an advantage and as a result tends to be less irritating as glycolic acid, but producing just as many clinical benefits. Then you've got your other AHAs, which are basically quite large and probably don't penetrate anywhere near as effectively as the other two ingredients and therefore you do not see as commonly in skincare preparations. So what do alpha hydroxy acids do from a scientific point of view to the stratum corneum? They increase the hydration between the cells and also inhibit certain enzymes, which as a result means it makes the stratum corneum fall off and exfoliate itself. By stripping off that stratum corneum, you actually get increased production rate from the basal layer and you get more epidermal cells turning over. As a result of this, it leads to a more compact, tight um, interlock stratum corneum, which has a smoother, more regular surface, which reflects light more effectively and feels a lot softer, and so you've got a, more, a, a less age-looking appearance to the skin. And increasing your epidermal cell turnover rate from that basal layer will mean that you end up thickening your epidermis in contrast to what a lot of people feel is that it's actually thinning the skin, which it is not. It is refining the stratum corneum. It is not thinning the epidermis. It's actually thickening the epidermis by increasing the cell turnover rate generated by that basal layer. So I've just explained that there what's going on with the keratinocytes. The fibroblasts, this is a long-term effect of the AHAs, will actually over time promote the synthesis of new collagen, but we're talking about years of repetitive use. It will also increase the synthesis of the glycosaminoglycans within the dermis, and this is the substance known as hyaluronic acid, and also increases the hyaluronic acid percentage composition within the epidermis as well. So this clinically creates two things, a better hydrated epidermis and a, and a thicker, more volumatic dermis. So if you look at the timeline of results, your short-term effects are all epidermal changes, where your long-term effects, you'll start to see your dermal changes. This is, gets a little bit science to hear about the biological response with the varying concentrations. So basically, weak concentrations, you're going to get pretty superficial changes, many limited only to your stratum corneum. And also, if they're basically not a particularly low pH, you'll get pretty much superficial benefits. Whereas your higher concentrations at lower pHs will give you much more significant um, clinical effects, both in epidermal and dermal changes. Now, when you're looking at a product, putting the concentration of an ingredient on it is one thing, but how much is actually biologically and bioavailable is another. Basically, it depends on the, whether the solution is buffered or not, what the actual pH of the solution is, and the actual concentration of the acid. So just because something says it's got 10% of glycolic acid in it doesn't necessarily mean there is 10% concentration available to exert any biological effectiveness on the skin. So ultimately, you, you need to be a pH of around between 3 and 4. And for really good clinical efficacy and long-term benefits and results in the skin, you need to be looking at using preparations that have a minimum concentration of at least 10%, which is basically what this slide just goes through. And then we all remember that wonderful equation that I could never completely understand at chemistry school, Henderson and Hasselbach. And again, that's just basically saying that the pKa and the pH and the concentration determine how much free acid we have. So the, the clinical take-home point is what you see on the jar is not necessarily what you're getting clinically delivered to the skin. Okay, so what happens with AHAs clinically? The epidermis, as a result, what we end up seeing is improved skin is smoother, it is softer. It's a reduction in dryness by compacting down the stratum corneum and therefore preventing water loss. But also, lactic acid is a humectant. A humectant means it has the capacity to be a water binder. So it's a moisturiser as well as being a good cell exfoliant. Less blackheads and whiteheads as, as a result of promoting stripping down the stratum corneum, it dissolves the keratin inside the pores, unclogs this and um, increases the cell turnover within the follicle as well, meaning to less clogging and finer texture of the skin. The dermal changes, as it builds up the glycosaminoglycans, you're going to have a more volumised dermis, a better moisturised dermis and therefore a smoother looking appearance on the skin. So what defines great skin? I was once asked to quote something for some sort of media thing that I've done in the past. And basically, I came up after dealing with many patients who complain of all different things every day to me and about what their unrealistic expectations are, is that great skin is about clarity, texture, tone, and evenness.